small crowd for the speakers, um, two people come home and discussed, I'm afraid, uh, because they came, for, they were coming for the other two speakers, they had to cancel it. But we'll have them next month, one is on Tuesday, and the other is surviving the NHS and whistleblowing in the NHS. Um, and uh, the top speaker will be on trade union issues, and that will be on the 29th of September. I'll keep talking for another 30 seconds, hopefully, that by then they'll be in here. <laughs> so, uh, make the place a little bit bigger. We have two good speakers, Mark from Mostly Fadal, uh, from War and Want on TTIP, and uh, this is Elliot, who's London uh, Green Party campaigns coordinator now, and he's going to speak on music and the environment, is it? Yeah. <laughs> He's also a top cello player, that's how he knows about music. Yeah. Mr. Simon there? Yes, yes, he's been there. Oh, yeah? Mm -hmm. yes. take, a, take a seat, we were just about to start. Right, Ellie? I need to be the end, because I'm letting more people in. So. Elliot is the first speaker on um, music and the environment, and thanks to him, he stepped in when the other two uh, had to cancel. So, uh, otherwise, Mark would have been talking on himself, so, <laughs> which I'm sure you wouldn't mind. <laughs> you wouldn't. <laughs> and we'll have a so there'll be thirty minutes after the speeches. There'll be thirty minutes for question and answer on both of, to both of them, and then after that we'll. Uh, retire uh, to the breakout room there uh, for some drinks and nipples and things and you can talk even more to the people personally. Yeah. Okay, Elise, off you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I it'd be criminal to bring along an instrument and not play it a little bit, so I'm just going to start. <laughs> The sounds we just heard are the combination of over a year of work by Luthier, uh, that is an instrument maker, and indeed actually the combination of 70 to 80 different separate parts of wood that have all been put together to create the instrument you see before you. Um, I played the viola, although that was a piece written for the cello, and um, indeed the viola is an instrument that's had a very interesting musical history, which is a, a subject for another talk. However, the music you just heard is written by Bach, who was actually one of the earlier composers who was very interested in philosophy and music as well. And actually, he was very much interested in the philosophy of the Enlightenment period as well, which is one of the areas which really kick-started the socialist um, kind of revolutions that came on later on in the uh, political thinking. So actually, this cutting edge philosophy of the time, which Bach was familiar with, um, he, he was really obsessed with the logical completion of ideas. Um, and Bach's music being primarily fugal, I think, Row, row, row the boat with more freedom than simple repetition, but with a view to discovering all the valid combinations of themes with delayed, transposed, and inverted versions of itself. It's very consistent with that philosophy and indeed ties into the logical thought that underpins socialism today. So, in my experiences as a musician, I've been somewhat less intellectual than Bach on many levels in a, in a lot of cases. Um, I studied at the Royal College of Music in London, which um, 
proclaims itself to be the greenest conservatoire in, in the UK, which is a fantastic achievement and actually it really does do a lot for the environment. It's one of the first to introduce uh, recycling stations and actually to really try and improve its building, which was a very large listed building built in 1882 by an exhibition room at South Kensington. So actually, um, I only joined the party about a year ago, and I think um, the greenness of the Royal College might have influenced me in some way to start getting involved in politics. But actually, when you think about environmentalism and music, it's not usually a subject that goes hand in hand, but those 80 pieces of wood that make up this one instrument have to have come from somewhere. Um, I'm quite lucky because I know the person who made my instrument and I know he is a, he's responsibly sourced a lot of the wood that's involved there, but it's been a subject that's been very difficult for many people over the last few years, uh, especially with the um, issues we've been facing with the rainforest yeah. and figuring out where we can start sourcing more eco-friendly woods and actually even in the pursuit of playing as well. Um, take, for example, a band that tours around Europe. Back in February, March this year, I was lucky enough to go on tour with an indie band from Camden, which is, uh, as, as I said, somewhat less intellectual than Bach. Uh, however, a lot more fun. Um, we toured around Europe on a bus, which probably got less miles to the gallon than a Ferrari, um, and um, indeed spewed some very nice gases all over the continent. Um, but actually, when you think about the costs of actually performing under these venues, you've got a significant amount of plastic being used um, in the venues when you're using the disposable cups and stuff, because glass is very uh, dangerous in crowded areas. Um, you've got um, massive amounts of flyers being printed off if they're not being printed on responsibly sourced paper. There's some real consequences there as well for environmentalism. And, you know, in everything, even from CD production, using rare materials to in the process of playing CDs, to actually the materials used to make musical equipment, it, there is a lot of capacity to actually find real holes in the methods that are used to make these items. So I'm going to talk a little bit about instrument making and how musical instruments are actually put together. With a particular focus, I was first off on the guitar, which is an instrument that more people are familiar with, um, and then moving on to the violin, the real issues that are faced with environmentally sourcing wood. So acoustic guitars, I think um, probably most of us have come across those, uh, and indeed probably quite a few of you played or play indeed in your spare time. Um, they're usually made from hardwoods such as mahogany or rosewood, which are sourced from the tropical rainforest. Um, and actually, occasionally also soft softwood sitka spruce, which is from the temperate rainforest in the Pacific Northwest. So actually, already we're starting to see some. Um, some hardwoods being used. Actually, and though an individual guitar uses only a small amount of wood, the higher quality of the materials necessary means that it's incredibly difficult to source the right quality wood to make an instrument. And indeed, one piece and another piece are never the same. The wood use is always unique. And actually, when it comes down to making instruments, you really need to have the highest quality materials possible, and that really does impact massively on uh, the range and scope of materials you have to work with. Um, so the desire for excellent wood from actually usually ancient forests is, um, is, is, is quite paramount amongst instrument makers, amongst luthiers. Um, and these forests tend to be spaced around the globe. There are some areas in highlands Europe, uh, other areas in, the, as I said, the rainforest in Brazil, some from the uh, mid-northwestern American uh, pine forest as well. Um, but actually, again, you know, for instance, rosewood can sell for as much as $5,000 per cubic meter which is an incredible amount of money and just shows the scarcity of the, these resources. Um, so actually this can encourage piracy and criminality and destructive harvesting, uh, harvesting practices amongst um, those, those organisations that source the wood. Guitar makers such as Fender, Gibson, Martin, Taylor have actually been working with Greenpeace and the Forest Stewardship Council to try and improve their sourcing practices. Uh, and indeed, um, smaller luthiers tend to have a much better way of dealing straight with dealers to get the best quality wood, and it's usually environmentally sourced. Though actually, fakery and forgery is quite, um, is quite paramount amongst the standard of wood used, and it can be sourced very, very dodgily in some cases, though the majority of the time this is absolutely, uh, obviously legitimate. Um, but sustainable management of these ancient forests that supply these musical instrument woods, and you know, these are places that help regulate the carbon cycle of the planet. It's a really crucial resource that we need to be looking at. For the violin and the viola in particular, um, many of the animal and plant species that are traditionally used to make the instruments are endangered or follow unethical practice. So for instance, um, 
lucky at my instrument in particular, I know that the body and back of my instrument are made of Brazilian, oh, sorry, not Brazilian, uh, Scottish sycamore, um, which was aged for 30 to 40 years before it was even carved into the form of the instrument it is today. <coughs> so actually, um, you know, you're, you're harvesting wood from years ago, leaving it to dry in incredibly controlled circumstances, and then leaving it and uh, eventually carving it in 30, 40 years' time. And again, the batches of wood that I'll put there, some are spoiled over time, some turn out not to be suitable, so not all of that gets used anyway for the specialities of instrument making. Some, some backs tend to be um, cut down the middle in half um, and glued together. I have a, a rare instrument which, is, which has a full back. Um, this isn't quite as common on larger violas because it's quite difficult to make uh, from one piece of wood that's exactly appropriate. Um, but it's, it's one full piece of wood covers the whole of the back. Um, so it's out of interest. The fingerboard itself, which is this part just here, where it's played on, um, just out here, <laughs> is made from ebony, which is a very rare word and also quite endangered as well. Um, particularly when it comes down to ebony, um, there's a quote from our rabbit check of the railroad supply in San Carlos, California. It says, though it is available, good ebony is scarce, and again, it comes down to this quality issue. There's a very small percentage that's really good for instrument making, he says. What we are looking for is something lightly poured, so that when you finish the surface, uh, finish the surface, it looks almost like baked light. Um, Morgan Anderson, um, who's another person from the same organisation, adds that the very best ebony came from Mauritius, but I have no idea where to find that anymore. So again, we have this problem where these sources are very varied from very different areas, and again, politically in the regions, it can be very difficult to maintain a steady supply of high quality wood from very tightly controlled areas. Um, it can be very difficult politically with um, tropical. Uh, with areas within the tropical boundaries, which um, often have unstable uh, economies of government. <coughs> um, so there's also a conservation group based in Cambridge called Flora and Fauna International, uh, which reports that only there, even though there are 475 known species of ebony wood, very few grow large enough to actually produce timber. Um, and of these, virtually all have become endangered or have been driven to extinction as a result of over-exploitation. So the organisation's long-term objective, uh, objectives include sustainable management of resisting, uh, remaining ebony's and rosewoods, and researching the possibilities of developing plantation production for these species. However, there are not any plantations currently known to be producing ebony sustainably as timber. So currently, the entire supply does end up coming down to being sourced from rainforest woods um, in not necessarily sustainable practices. Um, so today, the best quality wood which is used in that respect. It comes from Madagascar, India and Sri Lanka, um, where obviously some of those areas have had reported human rights issues over the last few years as well. Um, but some of these countries have export controls. Um, there are indications that this protection is more apparent than real and, and illegal logging and smuggling are involved in supply and continuing demand. So there really are a lot of issues with this that we need to start addressing. Though the, um, the, the largest cause of concern, actually, that comes down for violins and violas, and cellos in particular, is the material used to make the bow. So, first off, the hair of the bow is made from horsetail. Um, the kind of pictures you're led to believe when you're younger <coughs> is that this is, you know, it's, it's um, just from you know, horse haircuts <laughs> back when they are um, you know, frolicking in the pastures, but actually it's usually to do with the horse meat trade in Eastern Europe and the tails of those horses tend to essentially be cut off at slaughter, um, exported, only the best quality ones. Uh, this isn't the only case, this is some of the stuff I've heard from some of the luthiers that I work with. Some will source from plantations and responsible, but I mean, you know, you really don't know as a musician where your, um, where your materials are coming from, so it's really an issue. You know, as a green who's working within the music industry, um, I have absolutely no clue, and neither do half of the people that I'm working with, in terms of where this has come from. Um, though actually, the problem is most people just don't ask or think about it. Whereas actually, you know, I tend to work with bow rehairs that have sustainable credentials and are trying not to work with animal cruelty. Uh, but the wood is another matter. So the wood that this, this bow in particular is made of, um, I think my bow was made in 1920 by a Czech maker called Czarpetsky. Um, this bow is made of Pernambuco wood, which is a Brazilian hardwood. Um, and in fact, Pernambuco is one of the rarer woods nowadays. Um, it was, it's been used for violin making for centuries, um, as it's one of the <coughs> most um, suitable bow materials there is. Its qualities of weight and flexibility are absolutely unparalleled. 
uh, and in fact finding a suitable replacement material for this has been almost impossible. Um, it's probably the material that's most critical to modern Luthery as well, as it comes from a single geographical area, uh, which is the Atlantic coastal forests of Brazil. And again, no other material has been found to match its qual qualities of wave strength and responsiveness. Um, it is not currently protected under the international conventions on sustainable wood. The Brazilian rosewood, which is indigenous to the same area, was given treaty protection in 1992, mm -hmm. which is a good start on uh, ensuring wood sustainability for instrument making. Um, the Good, the Good Wood Alliance, which is a conservation group based in East Hampton, Massachusetts, estimates that less than 3% of the original habitat in the Atlantic Forest of Brazil remains, which is you know, really quite a critical issue um, for wood making. And bow makers have made valiant efforts to use responsibly and find <coughs> services. Um, and professional players continue, to, but uh, a lot of professional players are under misconception that pun and buco is the only option, and that any other options are actually not you know not as good. Um, I have with me today another bow which is made from carbon fibre, so the same material that's used to make some aircraft exteriors and boat hulls. Um, and actually, to play with, it feels remarkably similar and sounds almost as good, in fact, as well. So um, just for purposes of cost-wise, this bow cost me about £150. Um, this one cost me just over a thousand. So you know. <laughs> In terms of actual quality, you know, you're getting a similar bang for your buck <laughs> with a carbon fiber bow, which is a lot cheaper to produce uh, and produces very, very good results. Um, again, the price of bows and instruments varies absolutely enormously, and it's not usually based anything to do with the uh, quality in terms of the wood used. It's always to do with the maker, the historical value of the instrument, um, other things like that. So my viola was made by a luthier called David Millwood, who's absolutely fantastic. Um, he's now working for a workshop in rural Wales, um, and um, this was actually one of the first instruments he ever made to his own design, so it's quite a rare example of his work, um, which is a really nice, uh, really nice to have. You know, carrying this around on my back constantly is a constant weight on my shoulders, as it were. Um, so another aspect that we have to consider is spruce, which is mostly used in violin making. Uh, the red spruce, which grows in the unique alpine microclimate of the Val de Fiennes Panaveggio forest, has fared better in the past than it currently is. Um, in fact, Stradivarius is a name synonymous with violin making. Um, there was a period back between um, 1645 to 715 where there was an unprecedentedly low amount of sunspot activity, which has been known, which has been named the Maunder minimum. So, just to give you an idea, in a 28 year period between 1672 to 1699, there were just 50 sunspots in that entire period from records that we can find um, from wood fossil data, rather than the current usual would for that period would be 40 to 50,000. So it was a very low area of solar activity, and that it, it had an unusually low uh, temperature <coughs> for that period of time, which meant that the alpine trees, the spruce trees that were growing, had uh, a, a very dense patch of wood, which turned out to have amazing resonant qualities. So. This forest in the um, in the region of the Valley of Fiem is known as the Forest of Violins because of um, the fame that came from Stradivarius's violin making. Um, so Panavegian spruce is is very 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 expensive nowadays, and it's it's also uh, being slightly overexploited at the moment as well. Um, how more trees grow in the Panavegian nowadays than loggers are harvesting, thanks to the traditions of conservation and the region, which has been really good. Unfortunately, that's been ongoing since the 12th century. Um, the local inhabitants are very good at making sure those forests stay intact. So, one of the big questions we need to ask is, what can we actually do uh, to try and fix these issues that we're facing? The largest issue is education. Most professional musicians have no, um, usually next to no idea as to where their instruments are sourced from in terms of materials. There's usually a very good head trial leading back to who's owned it, and Luthi is an expert in wood uh, analysis, dendrochronology, I think is the name for analysing the historical area of where wood comes from, um, can provide good insights as to where a wood has come from and when, in what period of time it was harvested. But of course, unfortunately, it's not always possible to track where it has been and where it's been made, and that responsibility rests with luthiers, the majority of which, modern wise, new violin makers which are making nowadays, are working in conservative periods. Um, my instrument was made in 1995, so I know the luthier that made it, and fortunately, you know, I've, I've established good environmental credentials there. Um, 
of when you think of the use of animal products in making instruments as well. Um, tortoise shell was common in, uh, it was commonly used back as well. Uh, you see the little the little bit on the bottom there, it's shiny, it looks like mother of pearl. I think on mine it's mother of pearl, but most of it is. Absolutely. Um, most of uh, that period is the more, the more expensive boats use tortoise shell from Pacific tortoises, which is obviously a uh, fishing practice which has now been discontinued. The use of ebony and bone as well, um, which sometimes is still harvested from Siberian ice, but again has been involved in the, ivory, the illegal ivory trade as well, has been used and now phased out, fortunately. And actually, having ebony bows, um, can, there's usually an aspect just on the very bottom here where this part here is sometimes made in ebony, uh, from ebony on very old instruments, uh, and very old bows, um, and they're actually sometimes very, very difficult to import into countries with restrictions on animal product imports, <coughs> which is very good. There is a field of study called ecomusicology, which I discovered this afternoon. Um, <laughs> this is the field that focuses on the relationships between nature, culture, and music, or more broadly, the relationships between musical and sonic issues both textual and performative, and related to ecology and the environment, which is possibly the best description ever. I've never heard the term sonic issues before. It's a good way of putting problems with sound. Um, <laughs> but again, you know, there are a lot of composers nowadays working with environmental awareness. Um, the Pulitzer Prize winning composer Ellen Tarfay's Willich's Fourth Symphony um, includes a children's chorus pledging to leave a verdant earth in the context of symphonic meditation on endangered and extinct species. Um, artists are all over the world engaging in climate change. Uh, composer Lon uh, John Luther Adams has written several pieces of Opposite of the Arctic, which draw attention to the fragile economy, uh, ecology of a place central to understanding climate change. Um, lots of activities around music making are very relevant for their connections, as I said before, including business, uh, music business concerts, recordings and instrument making. So quite a few modern bands are leading the way in improving their climate uh, footprints. Um, for instance, Cloud Cult has experimented with very much environmentally friendly touring methods. Green Day have lived up to their name and worked with the National Resources Defence Council on various environmental issues. Um, the quite prominent animal rights activist Moby, who's um, quite a famous songwriter, um, he's worked in a lot of animal rights and veganism, which are complemented by him actually undertaking limited touring to reduce his carbon footprint and increase the excitement and value of his live engagements. U2's world tour in 2009 was heavily criticised for their environmental doublespeak. They're incredibly well known for their commitment to environmental activism, um, but they involved incredibly large stages which were transported across the globe. Um, they did purchase carbon offsets and encourage their audiences to do the same to try and limit some of the damage done, although there is, a lot of, there is potential criticism there for essentially paying to reduce the implications of having to pay for a tour. Uh, again, it's kind of capitalism fighting capitalism, which potentially isn't the best way of doing it. Um, numerous music venues also um, are making environmentally conscious practices part of the norm for concert goers, from minimising waste and promoting locally sourced products, to providing sustainability education, and powering it with climate-friendly alternatives such as solar energy. A perfect homegrown example for us would be the Young Greens work at Glastonbury this year. They went and set up an eco-commune um, a little sustainable living village and um, produced no waste for the entire time of the stay. Um, and it was a very good pioneer project, and I've heard back that they, I think, they will be going again next time if, um, if they're invited back, which would be good too. So, basically, to summarise, um, music traditions do interact in incredibly complex ways with the climate crisis. In some cases, they may contribute to promoting awareness, um, as with the messages and songs and concepts of successful musicians. Um, or, ultimately, they might encourage the conservation or sustainable development of a natural resource, as with musicians fundraising, or with violins, or luthery or instrument making, and that sort of areas. In other cases, musical tradition may cause environmental destruction, as with the use of uh, specialised guitar woods, violin woods, and viola woods, um, and cello woods, and bass woods, and clarinet woods, and various other instruments, <laughs> of course, as well. Um, or they may result in destructive environmental behaviour, for instance, touring or with concerts. The cultural traditions of music making are really very much wrapped up with global warming, um, and the social clout that artists have should is, and is being used to promote environmentally friendly practice in the industry and in the wider world. Thank you. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, I think you've thrown in a few words that most of us never heard of before. <laughs> uh, 
including one you hadn't heard of until today. <laughs> uh, thanks very much, definitely food for thought there. Right, we've got Mark.